Buonasera a tutti, thank you so much to Ilaria, to Paola, uh, and of course, as Paola said, we're very, very grateful to Club to Club, to OGR. Also very grateful to uh, Caius Paulson, to Young Turks, to Bank Abu Gais, uh, who is uh, Kamasi's manager, who is here. Uh, and of course, deeply, deeply grateful to Kamasi. And please uh, join me in giving another very, very warm welcome to the great Kamasi Washington. many times to meet in London and uh, it's actually a miracle finally you know we happen here in Torino for the first time ever since uh, Kai has actually introduced us uh, indirectly and I kind of wanted to begin with the beginning and sort of talk a little bit about your trajectory and then of course talk also about the Whitney Biennial because that was a, an amazing present of your work you know in the context of the art world particularly for many many here but I wanted to begin with the very beginning because you began very, very early with music, and I wanted to ask you to tell us how you came to music and how music came to you. Because you're a second generation musician, uh, music was somehow always there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't really even remember the beginning of music for me, and I was kind of always there. Um, as a kid, I, I started off on drums, and then I switched to piano, and then clarinet, and um, I really remember more like when I was about 11 years old, I got into jazz. And that's where music became more of a personal thing to me, not just like something that one of my family did. It, it, it felt more like what I wanted to do. Um, and then when I found the saxophone when I was about 12, uh, and I, it was like my voice. I found my voice in music, and that's when I knew I was going to really be serious about music. And what is also so extraordinary is that you met uh, colleagues and collaborators of yours with whom you've collaborated ever since, actually, when you were three years old. And you met the Brunners, Ron and Stephen Sabakat at a very early age. And there is a kind of a rumor uh, that when you were three, and I think Ronald was a year and a half, you sort of had a first concert event. <laughs> we, yeah, yeah, we had, we supposedly had a drum battle at my <laughs> third birthday party. And, uh, I say I won, he say he did. He still plays drums, so I guess maybe he, he won the drum battle. Um, yeah, we, we were friends, and um, it was an interesting thing because music was there, but it was, you know, we're kids, so it wasn't really, you know, we also played hide and go seek and, <laughs> you know, the tag and basketball. Um, and actually, most of the people in my band, like um, Ronald and Stephen, went to elementary school with Brandon Coleman. Um, plays keyboards with me and so and he didn't play keyboards back then he was just our friend and like, his brother played keyboards and we all worked up to him he was like Marcus's little brother and then much later on like when he was like 17 he decided to start playing keyboards and um, uh, uh, Tony Austin the other drummer as well they, went, they all went to elementary school together so that's how I met them and um Miles Mosley and Cameron Graves I met in high school. So, <clears throat> yeah, my musical family really kind of felt like a family, you know, it's, you know we argue and fight and stuff. <laughs> it's, uh, but there's an understanding because we all really taught each other music. Like I learned music from Mom and Stephen, they learned it from me, I learned it from Brandon, they learned it from me. So there's a real understanding of each other musically that's really hard to duplicate um, because there's just like a really like a there's a vocabulary that we all kind of speak musically because we talk to each other. And it's interesting that um, you know a few years ago we worked on a book with uh, Rick Collins on the Japanese architecture movement uh, metabolism, and we discussed a lot that like almost every movement or kind of group needs a catalyst. Uh, very often, you know, a trigger or a catalyst who is kind of invisible but creates in a way the glue or brings people together. And it's interesting that your father's teacher, Ricky Andrews, had this band, the Marty School Jazz Band, and you mentioned in previous interviews very often the kind of important role he played in kind of, you know, gathering people, bringing people together, making junctions. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, it's, it's really amazing because the, the, the real truth of the matter is that I met Ron and Stephen when I was a little kid. Like I said, we, we would play music together, but it was music was like, it was on the side. 
But but when I got to, by, by the time we got to high school, we were all in different schools, so we weren't really playing music together. We didn't really see each other that much anymore. And it was Reggie Andrews who kind of really brought us all back together. He would go to each and every one of our schools and pick us all up and take us to Lock High School, where we met other musicians from our neighborhood. Because there was a there's a thing in in, in the U.S. And definitely in California. Um, it's called the Maggie program, so like they take kids from different from inner city and they kind of disperse them around the city. Like especially if you're talented or like good at sports or if you're smart, they 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 they, they bust you around the different schools. So a lot of us, even though we lived in the same neighborhood, we didn't see each other because we went to different schools. And Reggie kind of went around and picked us all up, bring us back together. Um, and yeah, he taught my father, he taught Patrice Russian, Bruno Chancellor, you know, Terrace Martin, Tyrese, I mean so many of the music the musical um, the, so much of the, the current musical heritage of Los Angeles comes out of the bridge now. And we spoke a lot uh, over the last couple of months with Arthur Dreyfa about LA and you know the amazing complex LA is not only for art but also for for music and you've of course been there, you know, for such a long time in in LA and it was not only um, this catalyst, but it was also a place which often pops up in almost every conversation when you describe kind of your formative years at Lamont Park as a kind of a hub. Uh, you mentioned that is a very important uh, kind of context. Can you tell us a little bit what happened there? Why that was so magical and what, what happened in, in Lamont Park? Yeah, the Park is an amazing place. It's, it's, uh, it really is that. It's like a hub, like a cultural hub of Los Angeles. Um, and, um, and the interesting thing is that it's, it's in an area called South Central LA, which if you look at the news, you think it's some kind of war zone. Like they, they, they portray it as a really dangerous place. And that's where I grew up. And you kind of see that and you start to think that about your neighborhood. And I remember when I, my father, he took me to Lamar Park for my first concert. It was uh, Farrell Sanders. He was playing this little club, smaller than this room here. Um, it was owned by Billy Higgins, the great time Billy Higgins. So they were famous came to the concert there. And uh, when I that was my first time going to North Park, I I didn't know it existed. And I was just in wonder. It was like there were like drummers playing in the park, there were people painting outside, there were poets, you know, there were rappers, there were blues clubs, there were just there's everything you can imagine like on the like a one block area. Um, and uh, from there on, I was like, a, we called, him, called ourselves the Merc Kids. So he, was just, he was just there all the time. I would be there 3 o'clock in the afternoon to 3 o'clock in the morning, just hang out and just absorb the music. And it was also really supportive. It was like when we were young, like 12, 13, 14 years old, Billy Higgins, who was one of our heroes, who played with Pete Morgan, and Freddie Hubbard, and Ornette Coleman, and all these people. He had a club. He would let us do our own shows at the club. More of ourselves. I get my, I get my dad's Rolodex and call every person he knew and tell them to come to our show at the World's Day. And uh, sometimes Billy would come and sit in with us. So it was like a, it was a real positive place. And it really kind of transformed my idea of my own neighborhood. I realized that it gave me a lot of pride to, 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 to be where I was from. And to, even though I was being bused away for school, I started to realize that there was so much beauty in my little neighborhood. And there can be, of course, <coughs> mentors, uh, which I call the places, as you described, which I call, but then it's also books. And that was very fascinating. You know, when I was like 14 or 15, I, I read a, a book of Joseph Lloyd's, like interviews about social sculpture, him founding the Green Party. And for me, it was a really epiphany. I read the book very times, it became an important trigger. So I was very fascinated to read that for you, it was also a book which played a very big role. And that was actually a book you were given when you were a pupil, uh, which was the autobiography of Martin X. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what this book, why this book was so important and what, what, what it triggered? Yeah, I was just kind of in the same mode. I, was, um, I, grew up, I grew up in an area that was considered to be, quote unquote, a bad place. And there was so much imagery and so many messages that gave you this negative outlook as to who you are. And so, even though I had great parents that loved me and did a lot of things for me, 
I started to see myself as being something that I wasn't. And uh, I, was, I was really blessed that these young guys, they were probably in their 20s, they came to my elementary school and they just took it upon themselves to um, kind of reshape our minds. And the first thing they did was they gave us the autobiography of Malcolm X. And his autobiography is just preaching like, so much positive energy about like who, who we are as a people and what our history is and what our place is in the world and what our purpose is. And reading about his life and how he essentially lost his life in that pursuit of spreading that message it really changed my whole outlook as to who I am, who I was, and what I was going to do with my life. And that negative view of myself, it, it can no longer exist because I, it, I understood the real reality of my, of my heritage. And then when you were 13, you knew that you wanted to be a jazz musician. There is this famous story of your father with the Charlie Parker solo. Can you tell us about that? Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> when I was about 11, I, I really learned about jazz. And uh, I had a cousin that gave me an art blinking tape. And that kind of like, and then I found my dad's record collection. And I started listening to all the art blinking records and new morning records. And my favorite musician in that, all those groups was Wayne Shorter. And so at that point I was playing clarinet and uh, I wanted to switch to saxophone. And my dad said no, he wanted me to keep playing clarinet and get better at clarinet before I could switch to the saxophone. So um, one day he left his saxophone out and I just took it and I, I figured out how to play this one song on the saxophone. And I was like, see, look, I can already play the saxophone. He was like, all right, well, if you're really serious, sing me a Charlie Parker solo and I'll give you an alto saxophone. And so I sang the, little, the, alto, the Charlie Parker song and he gave me an alto saxophone and I was, <laughs> Was it? And then there was a record, there was uh, Coltrane's transition. Um, so we have a book, you know, we have a, a mentor, we have a place, and, and there is a record. There's an epiphany around the record. Uh, can you tell us about Coltrane's transition? Because Coltrane became a kind of an obsession for you, and it's interesting because since you were a baby, your father kind of tried to get you hooked on this record. It sort of took some time, but then it really started. And what I found also very fascinating is that at such young age, you got then very obsessed to, to really practice. You said it was almost like in a monastery. It was almost like a monkish <laughs> existence of practicing as many hours as Coltrane would practice. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, my dad, you know, he was ambitious. So when I was little, little, seven, eight years old, he was like playing Don Coltrane records for me with the hopes that I would be into it. But it was, I didn't get it. It was like, it went over my head. And so, you know, I, I was, I still like jazz, I was in the art body team and people like that. And then when I was about 15, uh, there was a Tower Records in Hollywood. And I took the bus down there and I, I, I got this John Coltrane um, Transitions record. And I, I thought I discovered it on my own. And so I was on the bus and I, I had a little, one of those discs in there. You remember those? Like the little CD players that you could take with you. And I was on the bus and I was listening to it and I was just like in my seat like going like, wow, oh, oh, good. Everybody thought I was crazy. They thought it was like they needed to call the police or something because I was like really like having an emotional response <laughs> to this record. I looked up and everybody was staring at me. You know? And uh, I went home and I was like, hey dad, you got to hear this record. This is the most amazing John Coltrane record you ever heard. He was like, that is my favorite John Coltrane record. I've been trying to play that record for you for years. <laughs> And uh, it really, it was like, it was the moment that I really kind of understood John Coltrane. He's like, I always say like John Coltrane music <coughs> is like, uh, it's like looking at the sun, you know? It's like, it's, it's, it's so bright and it's so like, over, it can be overwhelming until you kind of get past that and kind of really see what it is and it's, and it's like the most beautiful thing you've ever saw or heard. Um, and uh, it's, um, so then I started reading about his life and he, and he talked about talked about so much about how he was so dedicated to music and how it was like, he kind of poured his whole life into it and that inspired me. And so uh, a friend of mine, Cameron Graves at the time, the piano player, um, 
he and I both kind of made a decision that we were going to practice like co-training. So we would challenge each other. So I'd call him at like 9 o'clock at night, and I'd be like, how, how many hours you practice today? And he'd be like, nine. How many did you practice? And I'd be like, six. <laughs> And it, you know, it fueled us, and over those years, we just really, I started to realize that kind of pouring your whole life into something like that, it gives you a connection to the instrument that um, kind of deepens your ability to create music. And then, of course, there is also the, the Stravinsky moment. There is, because it's, I think it's interesting, you know, thinking about all these inspirations, it's, besides jazz, also very much Stravinsky, but probably, and I'm particularly interested in. Your, your obsession for the right of spring, because I kind of became a curator in a big part because of Yagida, because I was very fascinated as a teenager you know, reading how he kind of you know, brought all the disciplines together through the Vallejos, and that gave me kind of a feeling that you know, through exhibitions or through curating, or maybe bring all the disciplines together. But for you, of course, it went through, through led through Yagida, but it went through Stravinsky, uh, and you, you really associated with this idea of the, of the right of spring, and, very early on as a kid wanted to play your own version of the Rite of Spring. Can you tell us a little bit about this learning from from, from Stravinsky? Yeah, so in high school I went to a I went to a music high school, Hamilton High School. It's a, a, a school for kids that want to be musicians. And so it was my first experience of meeting kids that wanted to be classical musicians. And so I made some friends and um, they I was a friend who was a French horn player. Um, and I was showing him McCoy Tyner, and he was like, oh man, that reminds me of uh, Ravel. And when I liked Ravel, he was like, oh, if you like Ravel, you should also listen to Stravinsky and Prokofiev. And so, you know, I was kind of going through all these CDs that he was giving me, and when I heard The Rite of Spring, it just blew me away. And it was like, I was listening to it all the time. And then I remembered that uh, Charlie Parker, was also really into Stravinsky, so I just really just dove in, and I, you know, I, 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 I went out and I got, I bought like a book that was a score for the Red Screen, and I started really studying his harmonies, and, and I was, I started listening to it, and I would do things like I would play over the Red Screen, like improvising over it by myself, and I always, you know, I always loved and that, that sound of his his um, approach. To, to, to his very rhythmic kind of um, dense approach to writing that just really um, resonated with me. Um, and there was a jazz composer named Gerald Wilson who I was also really into. And, and Stravinsky and Gerald Wilson both, like, they really shaped the way I think about the relationship between them. And then was another epiphany. And that epiphany I found in another interview you, you gave where you said, but at some point, this multi school jazz band played at the jazz festival. It's the band we discussed earlier, um, where you all work, work together. Uh, and you all of a sudden, as a teenager, ended up having a solo. Uh, you weren't really prepared, and suddenly, as a teenager, you stood in front of 18,000 people uh, and you didn't play the way you wanted to. And you said that that lit a fire, a fire which never went away. Can you tell us about what happened there? Yeah, I was, um, so at Hamilton, at, even at this music school, um, I was kind of considered, you know, one of the, one of the best saxophone players. And, um, um, but Reggie Andrews had another band, and so that band was all my friends that lived in my neighborhood. And so he created this, like, kind of neighborhood band. And when I went to the neighborhood band, I was not the best saxophone player. There were, like, some really, really great musicians like Isaac Slim and Terrace Martin, who was a little bit older than me, and Corey Hogan, and um, Red Lana Bruno Jr., they were all there, and they were like really, really good, you know. And I was, this is before I had my uh, cold train and with the camera. Um, I hadn't really put the time into the instrument. I, I was talented, and I, and I listened to a lot of records, so I had a vocabulary that kind of made it seem like I was maybe better than I was. Um, and so I went, went to that band, I wasn't one of the solos. You know, the, the, those really advanced guys were the solos. And so we played the Playboy Jazz Festival. And I, I thought I wasn't going to have a solo. And I kind of come to grips with that idea that I'm not going to have a solo, it's okay, maybe next year I'll get a solo. 
And so we're playing a concert, and it's really like a sea of people, like 18, 20,000 people. And we were playing Freedom Jazz Dance by, by uh, Freddie Hubbard. And he just pointed to me and said, take a solo. And I was like, me? And uh, I stood up and I took a solo, and I, I, didn't, I wasn't happy with the way I played. And until that point, music had always had a very positive, happy, kind of feeling for me, and I just knew that like from then on, like I wanted to always be prepared, and I wanted to like really take music seriously so that I can play anything, anytime, anywhere, and, and never feel like I'm not ready. And then of course, the whole other side of things from time was when you studied ethnomusicology at, uh, at UCLA, and you talk often about the interest of the Gamelon in Indonesian music, which kind of interesting because that inspired Philip Barello for many of his polyphonic uh, installations, uh, but also North Indian kind of classical music. Can you tell us a little bit about what you learned from this kind of study of, of musicology and how that kind of developed? Yeah, well, so when I graduated from high school, um, I was contemplating whether or not I was going to go to school. I was, um, my mom was a chemistry teacher. I was really into science and math in high school. And so I was contemplating if I was going to study music in school or some science for math. And um, my mom was saying to me that, you know, you already study music so much, you don't really need to go to school for it. You can study something else that you actually learn more from. And, um, but I didn't decide I wanted to be a music major. But I did want to study something in music that was outside of what I was already doing. So when I decided to go to UCLA, they had such an amazing ethnomusicology department. And so I was really unaware of most music outside of Europe and, and America. And so it was interesting to me to like learn the, the theory behind Indian music and music from Zimbabwe and Indonesia China and uh, the Native American music. And so when I went there, it really opened my eyes to the kind of infinite possibilities of music. And just the fact that it can exist in so many different ways. And that there were some music from some places that you would hear it, and to the average person, they wouldn't even register it as music. Like we were the second band that Smith decided to put together. And so this band was like mostly jazz musicians, but we all kind of grew up in LA and South Central LA. So we definitely had a, a disposition that was like, we really loved Snoop and all the music they made. And, um, so we started learning the songs. And so for my ear, you know, they seemed pretty simple. And so like, you know, I was really kind of like thinking it was going to be a breeze to learn this music. And as they were trying to teach us the music, you know, tell us to play some really simple line like bop, bop, bow. And if you played it, if I went bop, bop, bow, they were like, no, that's not it. And like most people don't really hear the difference between those two things. It's like there's this microscopic kind of like thing that we look at it as we call it groove, but it's really tiny and it's and it's um, the phrasing and the way and how you play something. And so I never really I mean that was always a secondary thing. Like when you learn music in school, you follow the phrasing, but it's it's really like a secondary thing. But for them, like the way you play something, and the timing and the placement you put it, and it's really kind of hard to like recognize way was the most important thing. And so it changed my outlook on music, you know. And like I can almost play the wrong note, but if I played the wrong note in the right way and the right timing, they would be cool. And so. I started to really listen to the music in a different way, and I started to really listen to how someone was playing something, not just what they were playing, but how they played it. And that really changed the way, myself and my friend, like Ryan Porter was on that same tour, Thundercat was on that same tour, um, Terrace Martin was on that tour, and it changed all of us the way we thought about music, and it um, really expanded my mind. When I brought those, that type of thinking back to jazz, where you also have to really think about the notes and, and, and the rhythms and the, the technique behind what you're doing, but also then adding that dimension of 
thinking about really thinking about how you're playing something and, and the relationship of how I play with something and how you're playing it. And that it, it almost made, took music from a 2D platform and made it 3D. Beautiful, and I read this morning a long article, I think it's in the, the New York Times magazine, where you're quoting exactly on that, because you say, when you play, play jazz in school, you talk about articulation, but it's a very light conversation. The question was about what you were playing and not how you were playing it. But when I was playing with Snoop, what I was playing was pretty obvious. Anyone with ears could figure it out. The question was how to play it with the right articulation and timing and tone, which is just what you explained so, so beautifully. And then you go on and say that basically that just playing the notes didn't do it for you anymore. And that meant that you started to actually see, see hip hop as a relative of jazz. I want to ask you guys a little bit more about that, how hip hop is a relative of jazz. Oh yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's different branches from the same tree, you know? Um, hip hop, one, I mean, you just listen to the, so something in the classic records where there's samples from jazz, and people like Battle Cat will tell you, who's like one of the architects of West Coast hip hop, that, you know, he grew up listening to jazz records from his, from his mom and his dad. And the, the whole energy behind hip hop, the, the expressiveness, the sense of, of self-expression, of individuality, and being yourself, and being real, and being true, has so much in the heritage of jazz. Um, even like the idea of like samples, you know, jazz, you would do things like take a Broadway musical and turn it into bebop. And hip hop would take samples <clears throat> and turn them into beats. Um, and just the, the when, when, when you start to really get to know the, the people who are making hip hop, you start to realize that their that their way of thinking is so similar to like my hero, like people like Gerald Wilson would really get along with someone like Slim actually. <laughs> they had a, such a similar way of approaching the world and thinking about music. Um, yeah, they're definitely very much related. Of course, that led then more and more to you kind of defining these categories in a way and to kind of be at, go beyond categories, transcend kind of musical categories because you say that kind of they actually prevent you from, from listening. Uh, and that's maybe a moment to talk about when you then found your own you know, language and to talk about your first albums. Can you tell us a little bit about your very beginning of your own recording stand? Because we spoke earlier this afternoon over coffee about Live at Fifth Street, Dix, where you told me it's a very rare record because you actually um, kind of you produced it yourself, you even fabricated it yourself, and you glued the kind of cover yourself. <laughs> and you tell us about this album, Life, the History, Dicks, and how it began on with your own kind of albums. Yeah, so Life, the History, Dicks, so that really was, was um, so in high school, I grew up with these musicians. People like Vandercat, Ronald Bernard Jr., Brandon Cohn, Cameron Graves, Miles Mosley. Ryan Porter, and we, we played every day. We would go to concerts together, we would go to each other's houses and drive our parents crazy playing super loud in someone's garage or bedroom or something. <clears throat> and then when we graduated from high school, we were, all, all of us were pretty talented and we all ended up on these kind of big tours and big gigs. And so we were kind of separated. And so what Fifth Street Dix was, was, that was the place that we would come back to and play together. So whenever we were in town, we would go to Fish Street Dicks and I'd play it. We'd play all night. So we'd go from you know, playing these huge stadiums with 60,000 people to this little club in the Murray Park with 20 people. And, uh, and that was just like kind of like our home base. And um, I, I, I made some money with Snoop, and so I, I, I uh, actually created a home studio at my, at my, at my, at my house. And, um, I forget who, it was someone else's idea, it wasn't, it wasn't actually wasn't my idea, maybe it was Thundercat's idea. He was like, man, we should record Fish Street Dicks, because who knows when we'll have this time again. And it was a very experimental time for all of us, like, that's where, like, Miles Mosley first started using pedals, and Brandon Coleman was experimenting with keyboards and keyboard sounds and stuff like that. So I basically took all the equipment I had in my little home studio and I brought it down to Fish Street Dicks one night and, uh, and we recorded and I didn't have a record deal or anything like that. I, yeah, just, we just really did it just 
to see what we sound like now, you know. And, uh, we had made a record before we were really young called The Young Jazz Giants. But Fish Street Dicks was like, we were kind of kids when we did The Young Jazz Giants. Fish Street Dicks felt like our young adult record. We were, we were like, we were grown ups now, even though we were only like 20, 21. Um, and so, yeah, I basically was only really making them for people that I knew. And so, you know, every week, there were like, like I said, there were like 20 to 15, 20 people that would come every week to hear us play. And they really kind of became our friends as well as our audience. And so every week, I would just make a few copies of that live record. And so I literally would burn the CD, and I would like, my girlfriend and I would cut out the artwork and stick it onto the CD, and then cut out another version of the artwork and put it in a little box, and basically just give them to people that, that we knew. And so, whenever I see someone with a young with that with that live at Fish Street Dicks record, I'm like, wow, how'd you get that? <laughs> and before we talk more about the epic, epic, I wanted to ask you quickly because about the two following uh, releases, the Proclamation and Light of the Rock. What was the epiphany of that? Um, so the proclamation, so after we made Fish Street Dicks, I was like, man, I should make a record at my studio in the house. <laughs> and so we made the proclamation, and, um, and that was basically, it was like an extension of what my other Fish Street Dicks was. It, was. it was during that same time period where we were all touring a lot, and, and I just, I knew that we had something special in my, in my group of friends. And so I always had this idea that I wanted to like document what we were doing because we were using our talents to do so many things. We were playing on some people's records, and doing all these tours, people like Warren Hill and Raphael Sadiq and Babyface and, and Brian and I, all these different really famous people that were making music. Um, and I always wanted to make sure that we kind of stayed home and, and, and also cultivated our own sound. Um, so that was what the proclamation was. Um, Light of the World actually was a record I made for my grandfather. Uh, it was his 75th birthday. And I said, hey, Grandpa, what, what, what do you want for your birthday? He was like, I want you to make me a record. I want you to make me a gospel record. But I want you to play like some Miles Davis stuff. Play some gospel like some Miles Davis stuff. So Light of the World is a gospel record that I made. And I kind of tried to make it in the realm of like in a silent way. And so, you know, and I actually, <laughs> I only made one copy of it and I gave it to him for his birthday. And then um, like maybe six months later, I was at like a, a family reunion and my grandfather had been making copies of the CD <laughs> and selling them to people in the family, <laughs> like in his neighborhood. And so I get there, there's like all these copies of Light of the World. I'm like, what the hell? Where did all this come from? And like, my grandfather had this little bag full of Light of the World CDs that he was selling. So I was like, okay, I guess I'll just <laughs> make some copies too. And was like, uh, a little one of those things that I only made a few copies, but you know, there's more of the copies of the Light of the World and the Proclamation that are on a lot of history days. I, I found this company that would make CDs for us. So I, I made copies and gave them to everybody in my. And the other day I was, uh, I was in Paris talking to Eden Sixu and she was saying, you know, my point is to write down dreams before we forget them. She has a notebook next to our bed and every morning write down the dreams. And of course, that leads us to the epic epic because uh, you often talked about the importance of dream in relation to, to, to epic. Can you tell us a little bit about that dream of a group of young warriors living in a village beneath a mountain? Yeah, so um, you know, it all kind of ties into the same the same theme of um, you know having something that's special that you're using in a way that is special. And I, I do want to I never want to make it sound like I was ungrateful for all the the great gigs and experiences I had with music and you know like playing with people like Snoop and Shaka Khan and Harvey Mason and Stanley Clark doing all those gigs it really shaped my music. But um, at the same time. During that time period, I felt like I had music that I wanted to give to the world that was my music, not just use my talent to to help other people make their music. Um, so we went in the studio and we made eight albums: the Epic, Miles Mosley's album, Ronald Bruno's album, Ryan Porter made a record, 
Um, Brandon Cohen made a record. Um, we all made albums. And so um, I wrote, I write a lot. Like, I'm the kind of person that just is always writing music. Um, and so I had a lot of songs. And so I ended up with like 40 songs that I was going to try to make my record out of. And, um, you know, and each one of your songs is like one of your kids. So you imagine like, it was very difficult for me to get from 40 songs to 17 songs. And it was like, these are like my star people. And I really love all these 17 songs. And so my plan was with the record was to record some songs and then write music on top of those songs. Because um, um, I always felt that in, in all those other records, they were so improvisational. I didn't really get a chance to really include as much of my writing into them as I wanted to. So with the epic, I wanted to include a lot more of my writing. Um, but I was really planning on making one CD or one disc thing. And so I couldn't get past these 17 songs. And I was just listening to them and I was trying to find some kind of way to take some songs out or make the songs shorter. So I was listening to music all the time. And then a friend of mine was, she said, you know, you're never going to finish this record unless you just keep moving. So she was like, why don't you just take one song and write the string part to that one song? And um, so I, I was like, you know, doing this at the same time that I was touring, so I wasn't sleeping that much. And half the time I would fall asleep in my studio while I was working. And so I was, um, I was in my studio, I was writing some string parts to change the guard. And I fell asleep and I had this dream about this guy that was living in a mountain. And he was like a guard and there was this little village at the bottom of the mountain. And all these villagers like looked up to this guy as being like the greatest ever. And they would send people up there to challenge him all the time. Just there was like an honor to be able to go up there and challenge him. It was a real vivid dream and I was I was just you know, it's one of those dreams when you wake up from it and you're like, wow. They should make a movie out of that. And uh, I woke up in my studio and I was like, I should write that down. That's like one of the dopest dreams I've ever had. And I went in the house and fell asleep immediately. <laughs> and I woke up the next day and I couldn't really remember it. And I was like, oh man, that sucks. I should have wrote that down. I just kind of remember that I had a cool dream. And then the next day, the same thing happened. Like I fell asleep and I had the same dream. And I woke up and I wrote it down. And um, that dream kind of gave me the inspiration to really finish that song, Change Your Guard. So when I went to the next song to try to write to it, I was like, I'm going to have a dream about this song, too. <laughs> it's like I kind of started to kind of like force myself into having this dream. But I was almost couldn't write the music because I was trying to fall asleep in the studio in the same way with the music playing and the host. And it kind of did. It kind of turned into this kind of thing where I was having other dreams and writing down the story. So like, almost before I could finish the record, I had to finish the story. And then the story kind of became the record. And then they kind of, I kind of finished them both at the same time. And so I had this little, this little pile of scrap paper that just had this story, like written in a, in a way that I can only understand it. Um, but it really is what allowed me to kind of take the record from a, just a bunch of songs and to make it into an actual album with a dream. And then there was also this idea to do a graphic novel, which I'm very fascinated by. Uh, I want to ask you about that stance, if the graphic novel happened, like it's an unrealized project, but how, how the dream and the, and the record would kind of connect to the, to the graphic novel. Yeah, it's still something I'm working on. I mean, so the story, um, it, it became more of an oral thing. So I told like, my manager, I told my dad the story, I told certain people the story, and um, I started to think, like, wow, this is kind of, it could have its own way. And um, I still am looking for the right artist, and I need to also, it's a dream, so like what I wrote down, it's not like a novel, it's like, I wrote down the ideas that if I look at it, I can look at that piece of paper and tell you the story. But I have to sit down and actually write it out, all the way out. And so I started doing that, and then in the midst of that, I started making some new music. 
<laughs> it kind of got pushed to the back. But I'm going to go back and I'm going to grab. I'm going to do that one day for sure. It's like one of my life plans for sure. And I mean, Epic has a lot to do also because you, you describe how all these different albums have kind of how actually different musicians work on their music. So it has to do with connecting people. Of course, your name has to do with connecting people. It's uh, uh, found, found his name actually uh, in, in Ghana, I think, and he misremembered the name, and so then he became. It was, a, it was originally Kumasi, right? Yeah, yeah. It's funny. Um, <laughs> he doesn't admit to it anymore, but <laughs> yeah, my name, my name, my, my, my dad was in a city called Kumasi, um, about a year before I was born, and uh, it was funny, I was just talking to my mom about it. <laughs> he came back and um, uh, he named me Kumasi. He said it did it on purpose, but she said they would argue about how he spelled Kumasi. And she said, no, Ricky, I think it's K-U. And he was like, no, I've been there. You haven't been there. It's K-A-E-N-A-S-I. And so I ended up being Kumasi instead of kept Kumasi. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, Kumasi, um, um, it literally means under the Kuma tree. But the story is that um, um, the Shanti tribe was at war with itself. And uh, they were trying to get peace. And what they did is they asked the shaman to plant two trees in two different cities. And whichever city the tree the tree grew up in, it would become the capital and that would be the ruling class. And so the tree grew up in Kumasi and when the tree grew, somehow everyone just stopped fighting. And it was a really big tree and people would come under there from then on to kind of hash out any bad problems. So if you had a problem, you go under the Kumasi tree and talk it out. And, and so it's, it kind of became synonymous with bring people together and bring them peace. So it's like it, it fit each other and it's kind of like if we have a problem, it's like to say let's fix our problem is the stone of the stone of the Kuma, the Kuma tree. So Kumasi kind of means peace bring. And it's beautiful because of course this idea of you know connecting people under the tree, which is also in that in that world, has so much to do with what you you think is music. You say music is about connecting people. Even if it's a quote from you, even if you're singing by yourself you're singing by yourself for someone. So you're multiplying yourself, in a sense. And this, of course, leads us also to your amazing, you know, many collaborations. And after doing Epic, you again went into a collaborative mode uh, to do actually music for other people. And that, of course, leads us to the collaboration with Kendrick Lamar, which happened almost at the same time, in a way, or sort of finished almost at the same time as Epic. Can you tell us a little bit about, about how that started and how you and, and Kendrick collaborate? Yeah, um, uh, Kendrick, Collaboration with Kendrick Lamar happened. Um, well, uh, Terrace Martin is the leader of Kendrick Lamar's music, and that was way before he was famous. He was this was in like 2006 or 2007, and uh, he was playing these mixtapes and his rapper from way back then. Like, and this guy's gonna change hip hop. He's gonna like he's gonna be the John Coltrane of, of rap. And um, so then they did. Um, um, Section 80, and, and then when they did Good Kid, Mad City, I became a huge fan. So I was you know, really into the music. And I had heard that Terrace and Thundercat had, were working on Kendrick's new album, but I didn't know what they were doing. And so that was, they were working on that record for probably a year and a half, maybe two years almost. And um, Terrace called me to come work on his album, Velvet um, Portraits. And he had heard about the epic. And um, so I played him, this was before that came out, but it was already finished. So I played him some songs from the epic. And when he heard the strings in the choir, he asked me who did those arrangements, because he didn't know that I was adding to writing. I told him I did it. He said, oh, man, I have something I need you to do for this new Kendrick Lamar record. And so they were really secretive about like what they were doing and what, you know, it was like a very like top secret kind of thing. So yeah, I came to the studio, I didn't know what they wanted me to do. I knew it was something to do with writing some orchestral type stuff, but I didn't really know what it was. Um, so I came in and they, they played me um, this, that skit that, this, that, that, that Kendrick has where he's interviewing Tupac. And so what they originally wanted me to do was just to kind of almost score that, that skit almost for the movie. 
And so we started working on that, but to really understand what that interview and that interaction he had with Tupac was about, we had to really hear the whole album. And so like they played the whole album, and they, one time, one day, they played the whole album for me like four times, and like every time they played the whole album, you know, someone would say, like, you know, Sal would say, oh man, you should put your strings on this song. You know, a little thing on here on, on King Kunta, or you should put something on, on what a dollar cost. And, then, um, um, and so in the end, I ended up working on a lot more of the records, but it was, uh, it was, it was an honor. I mean, Kendrick is a very brilliant, brilliant um, artist. And the thing that really hit me was when I came in to hear the record, um, a lot of my friends that I grew up with were on this album, and I could really hear that he was able to really pull out the essence of those musicians and put it and leave it into his own music, which is a very difficult thing to do. And, and not many artists are willing or able to do that. And so. It was really fun to, to work on a record in which there were no barriers, there were no boundaries, there were no limitations. You know, I could do whatever I want, you know, and it was, uh, it was great. And not only the trans music, it has to do with Kendrick, but also with you. It has also to do with your own work, with ethnic and, and everything you're doing, which is basically that, that idea that something can be stimulating, intellectually stimulating, and super advanced, but that doesn't mean it necessarily has to be underground, you know? And uh, I remember always when I met Alain Rocrier for the first time, he was a French novelist who founded, uh, was kind of very much the origin of the Nouveau Roman. He said, you know, we should, we wanted with the Nouveau Roman to write literature, which is super experimental and also mainstream. And for me, that was, I always, I never forgot that. I think about it every day. That's, you know, what we should somehow do. And then when I read your comments on Henry Lamar and on your own work, I found that same, thing in a way, what we have said, that you want things to be highly stimulating, highly experimental, but yet at the same time not underground, but mainstream. Can you talk a bit about that? How that plays in to be the butterfly, how it plays in Edward in your own work? Yes, one of the major struggles within music is that there's an idea that um, in order for things to be accessible, they have to be very simple. And um, I've always disagreed. I feel like things are accessible when they're relatable. So if you make music that people can relate to, then they'll access it and they'll understand it. Doesn't mean it has to be like simple or repetitive or uh, like a loop. Um, and so Kendrick with the Butterfly, I feel like he really kind of just dispelled that myth that like, if you want to make music that people can kind of widely enjoy and, and understand, that it has to be super simple because that record is so complicated and there's so much um, uh, involved in it harmonically, rhythmically, lyrically, and uh, structurally. Um, it's a very dense, very complicated record, but like, you know, you see all different types of people from all different walks of life enjoying it and like really understanding it. And so I always thought that same thing because, you know, I mean, maybe I'm smart, but I don't look at myself as being superior to the people around me. And so I feel like if I can understand something and I can, I mean, if I can relate to it, I can hear it and enjoy it, other people can as well. And so this idea that people aren't smart enough to, to, to understand complicated music, is like, that's not what it is. It's just, you have to pour something into that music that they relate to. And I feel like actually most of the greatest records, the most popular records you can think of, are all pretty complicated. Like the Beatles music is really complicated. It's more complicated than the average rock and roll music, you know. Stevie Wonder's music is very complicated, you know. Miles Davis, James Brown, people you think of as being simple, is actually very complicated. And so that idea of music needing to be simple in order to be popular, I think that uh, Kendrick really kind of blew the doors off of that. And you, of course, do that so brilliantly, and that leads us to harmony of difference. The kind of last uh, thing I wanted to ask you about, which is uh, both your, you know, your new piece of music, but also the installation for the Wiggly Biennial. And it's again very accessible, it's, it's, it's amazing energy in it, yet at the same time, it's very complex because there are these five movements in it. There is desire, there is humility, there is knowledge, there is perspective, and there is integrity. Can you tell us about 
harmony of difference and the appearance of it in the weekly biennial, but then also the the album of which. Yeah, yeah. So when the, the Whitney Museum um, came to me and they asked me to do something for the biennial, and so I was trying to figure out what I should do, and uh, you know, I was thinking about all the interests I had, and um, I was kind of really having a hard time figuring out what I would do that I felt would, 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 would fit into that into that format of being in the museum. And, uh, it was the same time that we kind of started to get the reality that we might end up having a Donald Trump as a president. And in that time, the energy in the United States was becoming so warped, and this idea of, of, our, of our diversity was becoming such a negative thing that like, because there were so many different types of people around, the thought was that we needed to stop to push people out and get people away and only leave a certain type of person and a certain branch of, of culture to stay in, in, in the U.S. And I always was against that. Because I grew up in Los Angeles, and in Los Angeles there's virtually every type of culture, every type of person that you can think of around the world lives in the same one city. And it's the most beautiful aspect of my city. And so I wanted to create something that really celebrated the idea of diversity. And so in music, um, the idea of connection is so important. And there's a, there's a musical device called counterpoint, where you basically are taking different melodic figures and balancing the, the amount of, of, of dissonance and harmony, basically the, the amount of difference and similarity to create a harmonious connection between these melodies. Um, so I wanted to take that idea of counterpoint and expand on it. And so I, what, I, what I decided to do is I created five pieces of music that I felt could stand alone and were, the, and were beautiful on their own, but that could have a relationship like we have in Counterpoint where you could put them together and create something even more beautiful. And so those five different parts um, of desire, um, humility, knowledge, trying to inspire in people was truth and that understanding of the truth of life and that like the real truth of life is, is, is not contained in any one culture, it's contained in all of our cultures. And, and anyone who's done a, a bit of um, traveling will kind of tell you that like, as you learn the different ways that people live and think and speak and look and eat and all those things, you start to really get a better understanding of the possibilities of life. And um, so those different parts lead to what I, I felt like was truth. And, and in truth, we play um, all of those melodies, all those songs at the same time in, in one song. And so I was telling my sister, who's a really talented uh, artist, I was you know, telling her about this. And as I'm telling her, I'm like, man, you should do some paintings in the same way. And I told her just to start off just creating colors and shapes. And so she started just doing that, and, and in that she came with a similar thing that I did, where she wrote, she created these paintings that were just colors and shapes. And then those colors and shapes, when she started to put them together, they started to just turn into a, a face. And it was um, a really great thing. And then my thought was that now, like, to take this idea of the combination of sound and take making the combination of medium. So we'll have music, art, and film. And that same idea of the of, as you bring the mediums together, it, so the experience, so so I, I met A.G. Rojas who created a film for Truth. And so my idea in the Whitney Museum was that you would come into a room and there would be a piece of music playing and there would be art and you would have a kind of single experience as you're hearing the music and you're seeing the art. And then at a certain point, the film would come on and everyone in the room had a shared experience of, of hearing this film and seeing the paintings and hearing the music all at once and kind of as a metaphor for what we're doing with in life. And I was wondering, because you said before that this amazing piece, Harmony of Difference, and you described it, I suppose you said that you can think about how ironic is how people live in places. 
better is diverse, we tend to love it, and the people that don't live in particularly diverse places tend to be the ones attacking it. Um, so you also actually have this idea of this piece not only being in the museum, being in different places, but that we may not realize. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I think our, our friend Caius, because my initial plan was just to have it in the uh, in the museum, and uh, when he saw it, uh, he was like, "Man, this is something that this is an idea that is bigger than just a short period of time in one museum in New York City. It's something that you should, you should share with with the whole world." And uh, when he said that, I was like, "Yeah, you're totally right. I should absolutely share this." around the world. Um, and it's been really cool. Like, I went to places like, you know, I went to China and people that heard it there. Were, you know, when I told them, I, I initially was in the one in New York. They were like, I'm so happy that you released it everywhere because there was no way for me to get to New York to experience it. And the whole idea of what the, the piece was about, it didn't really make sense to only have it in one place. It is something that should have been shared with anyone who wanted to. That leads us to the very last question, which is the only recurrent question in all my conversation, which is about unrealized projects. We know so much about architects' unrealized projects because they publish them every day, but we know relatively little about, you know, visual artists or musicians or composers or you know novelists' unrealized projects, which is why I archive them. And I was curious if you could tell us, after having told us so many amazing things about your realized work. Can you tell us a little bit about some projects, or maybe one project, which is unrealized? If you have projects which are too big to be realized, or too small to be realized. There are many reasons why a project can be unrealized. So with Lessing, I was talking about that approach to also which was sensor, but then maybe it's also a project which was self-sensor, which is not even there to do with a project which are too expensive to be done, or just simply dreams. Yeah, I have lots of those. <laughs> uh, one of them is the, is the, is the graphic novel. Um, that's definitely a, a, a project that I want to finish. And I, I, you know, it's, to me, it's about um, one finding the right artist that can, because the story and the music are interweaved in a way. It's a long story. Like, it takes me like two hours to tell it to someone. Um, and so that's something that it's not going to stay unrealized, but it is unrealized at the moment. Um, uh, most of my unrealized projects are like that. I have these stories or ideas. You know, I had another story that was that um, called the Afro Show, and I, I thought it would be amazing to, to get um, a um, choreographer to choreograph the story. It's kind of a story of reality, and, and uh, it's a, basically a story of a character that um, lives in a world that we look at as being not real. Um, but in his world, our world is not real, and, and it's, it plays on that idea. Um, and I have music that I wrote for that as well. It was, it was, I was, it basically, I, I, wrote, I scored a, a, a film that's about these professional video game players. <laughs> and it was like meeting these people in their relationship to the game kind of inspired me because they, these characters are very real to them. But we look at them as not. And so I, I had this idea of a story where those same characters knew about our, these real people and they had the same kind of sensation with them. And there's one character in it that understands both. And so, um, yeah, I hope that most of my unrealized projects will become realized. Um, and then I'm also working on a new album that. Um, I'm, I'm pretty much almost finished with it. And um, I have a, an idea of a series of short films that will go with this album because it, it, it also deals with the idea of reality and just the notion that the world is, no matter what you're doing, what you make it to be. And that sometimes we don't realize that. We don't realize that what you're doing, whatever it is, and how small it is, how small you may think it is, is partially responsible for what the world is. And, and so yeah, I have uh, quite a few. I think big is fine. Thank you. <laughs> that could not be a more wonderful conclusion. Many, many thanks and a very big round of applause for you.